every curse, you're the cure. For every sickness, you're the healer. For every storm, you're the calm. For all that's lost, oh, what a Savior. And on that cross of Calvary, where every burden has been defeated, and every wretched heart redeemed, you drown our sins in seas of crimson. Hallelujah, death is beaten, Christ has risen from the grave. Hallelujah, it is finished all to you, the highest praise. And on that day of utmost glory, when all of darkness cannot tear me, Every shackle will come undone. My solid rock, thine is the glory. And every shackle will come undone. My solid rock, thine is the kingdom. Hallelujah. Death is beaten. Christ is risen.
close, close to your side. So heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one. Oh, hallelujah. Oh. Shake before you, the demons run and flee at the mention of your name, King of Majesty. There is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am. Great I
mountains shake before you The demons run and flee At the mention of your name King of majesty There is no power in hell Or any who can stand Before the power and the presence of the great I am, great I am, great I am, the great I am, great I am, great I am, hallelujah, Open your Bibles with me to Colossians chapter 4, please. We are picking up in uh, verse 7. Today we are finishing up with this uh, small letter. And we, uh, God willing, we'll begin uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, next Sunday. we got to change that on the bulletin. I always forget to, to send uh, Steve uh, or whoever's doing the bulletins up. Uh, the new image for the new sermon series. And we'll have a new book, but the old image from the last book on there. Um, so, the book of Colossians, or the letter to the Colossians, started off with doctrine. Chapters 1 and 2 was uh, really doctrine. It told us about the preeminence of Christ, the superiority of who He is, that He is before all things, He says in chapter 1. Christ is before all things and above all things. And then in chapter 2, Paul says, And in Him you are complete. In him you are complete. And he said these things in chapter 1 and 2 because the issue of Colossae was the infiltration of false teaching, high-sounding philosophies, um, the beating of the body to be, you know, to merit some form of righteousness, some Gnosticism, Eastern mysticism, a bunch of the isms there. All this stuff was creeping into the church and being accepted by some there. And so Paul writes this letter to direct their eyes away from the flesh, away from man, and back to Christ and what Christ has done on the cross of Calvary. And that's why he, 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 he lays out the person and the work of Christ beautifully in chapters 1 and 2. And it tells them, in him you are enough. In Christ, we are more than sufficient. So in chapter 3 and 4, then he sort of puts legs on the doctrine. He puts legs on doctrine, and he starts talking about duty. The duty of every believer in light of who he is, right? If we know who he is and what he has done, we're going to know who we are and what we need to do. Let me say that again. If we know who he is and what he has done for us, we're going to know who we are, who we truly are, and what we need to do for him. So in chapter 3, he starts off by saying, look up, right? Keep your eyes in heaven, on Christ, who is seated at the right hand of the Father. Notice, seated, because he's not working, he's done the work, it's in completion. So we keep our eyes on Jesus, and we recognize that we are dead to sin now in Christ, and alive to Christ. 
So then he lays out the practical evidences of, of, of knowing who he is and what he has done for us by talking about relationships, by talking about putting on love and how that looks like in the church context and in marriage and in parenting and in the workplace. So that was chapter 3. Now in chapter 4, he starts sort of <clears throat> giving the, the shout-outs to the people that, uh, that are in Colossae, some friends, some churches. But he also mentions a few guys by name who were doing the work of ministry with him in Rome while he was in chains. And often, at least me, I, I assume some of you guys can relate to this, when we get to, it's often the beginning verses and the ending verses of... Um, of letters that we sort of disregard, well, they're pleasantries, right? Well, grace to you, whatever. Or, and then, oh, yeah, say hi to so-and-so and this and that. But, you know, those verses are very important and as well. God, the Holy Spirit, chose to put them in the Bible for a reason, and there is truth to them. So the way I, I've laid out this message is by breaking down each of these ten names. And I put it pretty simply. Each name that I'm going to show you here through, uh, as we go through the message has one Christian virtue or truth that we need to apply to our lives so we can be well-rounded Christians. So let me go ahead and pray, and then we'll begin, begin in verse 7. Father, we, we thank you for your word. We know that it is active. It is sharper than a double-edged sword. It is living, and it has the power to penetrate our hearts and minds and conscience. So we ask that your word would, just, would do that uh, this morning, Lord that uh, you would uh, challenge us, convict us, prick our hearts, Lord. If we need to repent of something, that we would do that, Lord. If we don't yet uh, have a relationship with you, that we would turn to you, Lord, that you would draw people unto you, Lord, and that they would uh, respond through faith and repentance. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's go through the text first. It says in verse 7, <clears throat> Now, I'm not pronouncing the names in the actual Hebrew, you know, the Hebrew pronunciations, you know, they do have some spit in them. The, you know, the, the, the actual pronunciation of, of, of this first name is actually Tuchicus, Tuchicus. But I'm just going to say Tychicus, okay? Tychicus. That's usually, if you, if you have one of those Bibles, that they, that they, the audio Bibles, they, they all, all also don't pronounce the names accurately all the time. So Tychicus... A beloved brother, he says, faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord will tell you all the news about me. This name means fortunate or faithful. Paul was fortunate to have this brother, and he gives three descriptions of him. He's beloved, he's faithful, and he's a fellow servant. He's telling the Colossians in his letter, he's like, this guy's going to give you rapport of what I'm going through here in chains. It says in verse 8, I am sending him to you for this very purpose, but not just to tell you about me, but so he, you can tell him about what you guys are going through. He says that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. Okay? What's going on in the church in Colossae? Last I heard from you guys, there was some false teaching. Is that still the case, is what Paul is trying to say here. Verse 9, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you, he says. Now, the story with Onesimus is that he was a runaway slave from Colossae or that area, and he belonged to a guy named Philemon who was actually a Christian. So this guy runs away as an unbelieving slave. He meets up with Paul somehow in Rome, and he gets saved through the ministry of Paul, and Paul writes this letter to Philemon. It's just one chapter. Uh, and and he's, in that letter, the gist of it is, look, I'm asking Philemon for permission to send Onesimus back to me so he can serve me, but let him free, give him his freedom. That's the deal with the letter of, uh, to Philemon. So Onesimus was this now converted slave who Paul is sending back. But notice he doesn't call him a slave. He calls him a faithful and beloved brother. And I think there's, some tr there, there's a reason he says, who is one of you. Treat him like a brother. Don't treat him like a slave. <clears throat> It says, they will make known to you all things which are happening here. <clears throat> Verse 10, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you. The other guys were fellow brethren, fellow servants. This guy has a, a unique uh, description. He's a fellow prisoner. Uh, most commentators will tell you that he was likely not necessarily 
arrested with Paul, but he chose to be in chains with Paul. And there's a difference. Kind of like Luke. You know, Luke went around with Paul. Luke wrote the book of Acts. Um, Luke wrote Luke as well. But he was a prisoner by choice. And that's one of the, 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 the interesting things about this guy. We also hear about him in Ephesus during the riots. He is taken in the riots as well. So he was with Paul in the riots. He was with Paul in the shipwrecks. He was with Paul in the um, when he was on his way to Rome, and, and there's this typhoon, and they end up shipwrecking the island of Malta, and Paul picks up sticks for the fire, and there's a viper and bites him. This guy was with Paul through the thick and through the thin. That's Aristarchus, and I think fellow prisoner is a fitting title. And then he mentions Mark. He says, with Mark, the co- cousin of Barnabas, about whom you received instructions, if he comes to you, welcome him. I think that's interesting because... If you are familiar with the relationship between Paul and Barnabas and Mark, there was, you know, there was some animosity there. There, there were some issues that caused them to separate. We read about that in the book of Mark. It's not Mark. Um, Mark wrote the Gospel of Mark, Mark, by the way. But we read about that in the book of uh, Acts. And what happened was Barnabas brought Mark with them on their first missionary trip, and Mark somehow, for some reason, bailed out on them right at the be- right during the get-go there. He didn't do the work of ministry. He just took off. I don't know the details, but I know that when Barnabas wanted to take him on the second missionary trip, Paul's like, no, nope, you know, go, you're not coming. And, and there was some division there, and Barnabas is like, well, I'm not going either, and they split up. And Barnabas goes to Cyprus, and Paul continues going where he was going. But it seems now, because this is the future, they are reconciled, and they're doing ministry together. So not only does Paul wel- not only did Paul welcome him back, Mark, now he's telling others to welcome him as well. Next, in verse 11, we read about somebody named Jesus. It says, And Jesus, who is called Justice, these are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. That's another way of saying who are Jewish Christians. So the last three guys, uh, Jesus, uh, or Justice, is, is a... And Aristarchus and Mark were the believing (coughs) Jews who were working with them. Now it says here in in the middle of the verse there, in verse 11, it says, They have proved to be a comfort to me. Verse 12 says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a a Gentile believer or Colossian, he says, A bondservant of Christ greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. So he was a prayer warrior. He says, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. So this guy, Aristarchus, he gets on his knees so they, his home church, can get on their feet and trust in the fullness and the sufficiency of Christ for them. That's really what, that's the idea behind his prayers here, that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God, he says. For I bear wit- him witness that he has a great zeal for you and those who are in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. So this guy, uh, what's his name, Epaphras, was the same guy that traveled over a thousand miles by foot and, um, and by sea to drop off a love offering, a financial offering, financial gift from Colossae to Paul. This guy traveled far by feet, but we also see that he traveled to his knees as well to pray uh, for others. So that's Epaphras. We'll, we'll look at more uh, on him in a little bit. Who else is here? Next we read about Luke. It says, Luke, the beloved physician. And I think even though Paul didn't dedicate much ink to Luke in this section, because of this one verse, we know that Luke was a doctor, right? That Luke was a physician. And Paul was one of the guys in the, in, in the scriptures that needed a lot of medical attention or medical attention regularly, because he was stoned, he was beat, he was in shipwrecks, he was beaten, uh, bit by snakes, right? He went through a lot of physical dangers and a lot of stuff, so it's such a blessing to have a, a doctor with you, a physician, and that was Luke, and uh, he doesn't need to say anything else about him. This is sufficient, I believe. And then we see another guy that he doesn't really say much about, right? He says, and Demas greets you. And I think there's a reason that he doesn't say that he doesn't have much to say about this guy, because later on we read that this guy deserted Paul. This guy uh, forfeited the ministry for the love of the world. Verse 15 says, "Greet the brethren who are, who are in Laodicea and Nymphos and the church that is in his house." 
Maybe one of your Bible translations says her house, and that's because um, the word can, you know, the, the name Nymphes can be either or. Also, the, the Greek word there can be his or her. One older manuscript actually has the word there, there, referring to the fact that it could have been a couple, but that's beside the point. If they are male or female or a couple, the point behind this is that this person or persons opened their doors for the ministry of the church. They were hospitable, or he was hospitable to the church. It says, Nymphus and the church that is in his house. See, the church has met in houses before. So it wasn't just, well, the church of Ephesus. It was really the churches of Ephesus, different house churches. That's how, that's how it was. They had worship there. They had the reading of the word there. And that's what we read here as well. Let's continue. Now, when this epistle is read among you, notice that, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So, the epistle from Laodicea. How come I don't find it in my Bible? Was this book left or this letter left out of the Bible? I, I think this wasn't necessarily a letter to the Laodiceans as much as it was the letter to the Ephesians, which was rotating around the region, which would, had now you know, been in Laodicea and was getting passed around through that, through that area. I think that's a, the better uh, understanding of what Paul is saying here as far as you know, the le letter to the Laodiceans. It's... It's really all these letters were passed around through the region. And what the people did, after they read them, they copied them as well. So they had their own copies too. So he says that, you know, say hello, read the letter among you. It says in verse 17, And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill, fulfill it. Tell this guy Archippus, whoever he was, he could have been the senior pastor or some church leader in Colossae. Tell him to keep going forward, to carry the ministry to its completion. That he, he exhorts, he wants to exhort this person. Was he discouraged? Was he going through difficult times? I don't know. Likely he could have. That's why he needed that encouragement. Last verse, verse 18. This salutation by my own hand, Paul, remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. Such a beautiful ending to a beautiful story. Paul's like, don't forget my chains. Don't forget about me. Don't forget the, you know, the, the sufferings of Christ that I'm going through on behalf of the church to continue to reach people. Don't forget about that. And that's, that's a great reminder, especially when it's coupled with grace, right? Just because Paul was in chains doesn't mean that he was outside of God's grace. Actually, being in we weaknesses gave him more grace. Uh, he, he said elsewhere in, in Corinthians, I believe, he says, when I am weak, then I am strong. The Lord told him after he prayed for this, whatever thorn in the flesh he had, he prayed three times, and the Lord says, uh, in, in the Greek, it's sufficient for you is my, my, my grace. My grace is sufficient for you, the Lord tells him, and it is in weakness when we are the strongest. Okay, so... I encourage you to take notes. I have 10 specific things aside from the points for this morning uh, to write down. And it's pretty simple. It's laid out pretty simply. And you have a name of a guy and then you have the main description of the person and what we can learn from it. Number one, take a kiss. This guy teaches us about teamwork. Teamwork. He refers to him as a fellow servant. A fellow servant. Notice not a loner servant. Not a, you know, the ministry is not a, a one-man show. It is a, a team effort. Paul might seem like the main character in the will of God for the Gentiles, and he did have a leading role, but Paul did not do everything alone. Paul was always joined by someone else. He either went with, Paul, with Barnabas somewhere, or with Silas or Timothy, and many others that I'm sure are not mentioned in the scriptures, but here we see that there's a few guys with him, and he wants to recognize, uh, he wants the church to recognize their, their roles. Because, see, winning is a team effort. Winning is a team effort. That's our first point. Winning is a, is a team effort. I cannot win in, in, in the ministry, if you will. I cannot win as far as the will of God for my life lived out practically if I, if I say, no, I'm going to do it all on my own. If I refuse the help, if I neglect people, the help, if I, if I reject help, th then you know what? What I'm, what I'm doing is I'm acting out on pride. 
Paul lays, several times in the scriptures, Paul gives us the, 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 the example of human anatomy, the body, when it comes to the, the body of Christ on earth. How, you know, some Christians are, are the eyes of the church, others are the mouths, the speaking gifts and all that. Uh, others are the feet of the church. You don't see them too often, but you know that they're there because the church keeps moving, right? Others are other hands. Others are, you know, different things, the heart of the church and all that, gifts of compassion and mercy. So that's how the body of Christ works. It's not a solo thing, right? I don't do everything here. Think of... Um, Think of a, um, in, a, in a movie, right? Normally what we do, we skip the ending credits if it's a Marvel movie. We'll stay for the ending credits, right? We'll, we'll stay till the end to watch that, that, that scene. But if it's not, well, we're, out of, we're out of there. Because, you know, we don't watch the movies because we want to know who the camera guy was or the, the makeup artist. But these guys were very important in those things. God is a director of our lives and every person matters because it takes every person to to get the ball moving winning is a team effort romans 12 4 and 5 say this for as we have many members in one body but all the members do not have the same function so we being many are one body in christ and individually members of one another look to your neighbor look to your left to your and to your right you are members of one another if the Lord has given you a gift, the gift is given to you to use it, to share it. It's like the gospel, right? We, 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 we've been given the gospel. We've benefited from the gospel. We are called to share the gospel, to go and proclaim it. Likewise, it's the same thing with the gift, with God's grace. We ought to be fellow servants. And that's what that word means, fellow servant. Strong's Concordance defines it this way. One who serves the same master with another, or one who with others serves and that was a key characteristic of this guy Tychicus he served with Paul not alone and Paul not alone as well I mean isn't it awesome when when you can go do something for the Lord with your friends with those that you 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 know that you have a friendship with you have camaraderie it, it, it's beautiful I, I'm encouraged to go to Mexico and minister to you know be out of my comfort zone because I know that Ricky was going, that John was going, that my kids were going, and their friends are going, and, and, and Victor was going. That, that, that's encouraging. Let me show you a few pictures from, uh, from Rosarito. It's encouraging that you're not there alone, that you have guys that, that have your back. Uh, it, it's encouraging to, to, to just serve the body of Christ with your friends. And you come back more united, more, uh, you know, the ministry does that. The ministry bonds you together with one another. I think that's what that word koinonia, fellowship, truly means. It's not just, you know, shop talk. It's, it, it's, it's serving the Lord together as fellow servants because winning is a team effort. Before I move to the, the next uh, observation here, in, um, when the Israelites um, cross the Red Sea and they enter the, the wilderness, not long after their wilderness uh, trails begin, the Amalekites attack them from the rear. And Joshua goes to fight the battle and lead the battle and all that. So they're fighting with these Amalekites. And Moses goes up on a hill and he's holding a rod, the rod of God. And he's raising it up. And as long as he's raising the rod up, they're winning the battle. But if his hands get tired and they start coming down, they start losing the battle. You guys, some of you guys know the story. So what do Aaron and Hur do? You get rocks to support it, right? They go and support him, hold his hands as well. And that's what I'm saying. The principle is in the Old Testament also, how we ought to come alongside each other and, and be supports for the body of Christ. Number two, now we read about Onesimus. Onesimus, the runaway slave, now a Christian, had a hard decision to make. Am I going to go back to my master? Or am I going to make a run for it again? As, it, as a bond servant of Christ, as a servant, you know, it takes, ministry takes hard decisions. I have to make sacrifices. When you become a believer, you know what? The, I think somebody said, Jesus catches this fir his fish first before he cleans him, not the other way around. So, you, you know, you, you, become, you get saved and, you know, you have your baggage and that stuff gets cleaned out as you walk with the Lord. We call that sanctification, right? So that's, as that stuff is, is being cleaned out, there's going to be decisions to be made. 
made. Okay, well, I've been cheating on my taxes. You know, I, I've, been, I've been doing this over here. I've been milking the clock over there. You know, I've been having this, this, relation, this unhealthy relationship. You know, those things get worked out as you're, as you're growing in Christ and the Word. And, but decisions need to be made. And this guy had a hard decision to make. He needed to, to trust in God to go back, make the risk. What if he keeps me here? What if he kills me, right? So he needed to trust that the Lord was going to be with him. Ministry, servanthood is about making hard decisions. Some of us have to re- reorganize our, um, our schedules. Some of us have to um, uh, prioritize differently. Some, I, I, know, you know, I know you have a life outside of what some of us call church people, right? Church people with your life. You know, we are the church. And God's cal- our calendar means nothing to God. God can come in and just change the calendar, change things up on you, right? He does that. He did that with Mary and, and Joseph when they were planning a, you know, a, a wedding. God's like, throw in a baby registry in there too because you're going to have a baby. And, you know, when, when, when Peter w- was fishing as well, the Lord's like, I'm gonna, let me make you fishers. Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men, right? God changes things up on people, and people have to make hard choices that take faith. Oh, man, I'm, I'm leaving my job? Walking by faith? I don't know if I can do that. Well, you, you can do that in Christ, and that's what this guy did by going back to his old master. See, usage is evidenced by making the hard decisions. Usage is evidenced by making the hard decisions. As a minister of Christ, as a servant of Christ, I have to make those hard choices to either leave something or, or start something. But really, it's, it's about decisions. Warren Wiersbe said this about Onesimus. Onesimus had been a believer only a short time, and yet he had already proved himself to Paul. He had already proved himself to Paul as, even as a, as, a, as a new believer, as a young believer. And that's so encouraging to see. Don't ever say, well, you know, maybe when I'm, when, when I'm in, in, in this Christian thing for two, three years, then I'll, then I'll start, you know, going to, to Bible studies or prayer or serving. Don't, don't, don't do that. I would encourage you to do it as, as, soon, as soon as possible because that's how the Lord grows us. The Lord grows us through ministry. Usage is evidence by making the hard decisions. Number three, Aristarchus. Aristarchus teaches us about companionship. If you're in an Aristarchus... You're that woman or man who, as soon as you see your brother or sister in, in, in some sort of trial or hardship, you're the first one to call them and, and be that, that, that shoulder to cry on. You're that person to, uh, to give words of wisdom and words of comfort. That's who Aristarchus was. He, he, he wasn't just with Paul in the easy times. He was with them in the riots, in the shipwrecks, and the storms of life. He's that guy who was with Paul. I think we all need an Aristarchus in our life, who's going to speak into, into our life, who's going to be there for us when, when nobody else is there uh, for us. And, and also, I would add, we, we need to be like Aristarchus. We need to show companionship. Now, for that to happen, we need a relationship, right? We need a relationship, and we need to walk in wisdom. Normally, I don't, when it comes to females, to women, I don't like, you know, Oh, yeah, give me your number so, you know, I'm going to go pray for you or talk to you and whatever. No, that there's a certain boundaries that we keep to avoid the appearance of evil. So I start relationships with men and my wife starts relationships with women. So find, um, uh, if you're a man, find a man you can trust in, you can confide in. If you're a woman, find a sister you can trust and confide in. Someone that you've spent enough time with that you know that as soon as you tell her something personal, they're not going to go and, you know, Tell somebody else, oh, I have a prayer request, which is really gossip in disguise, right? <laughs> um, so, so what I'm saying is the Bible says in James to confess your sins to one another, and, 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 and we help each other. We keep each other accountable. You know, we struggle with things, so, so we need to find our Barnabas, if you will, who's going to keep us accountable and, and, and encourage us and be there with us during the difficult times of, uh, of life. I'll get that later. Let me show you two verses. Galatians 6, 2 says, Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. To bear something is to carry it with someone else. Carry each other's burdens is another way to, to render this, uh, this verse. Am I bearing my brother and sister's burdens? Am I coming alongside them to help re- relieve them from some of the weight? 
In Ecclesiastes 4.9, a more familiar verse, it says, Two are better than one, for if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Another question for us of application is, who, is, who can help me up when I fall? Who can I call to, to lift me up when I'm having, you know, when you can't talk to your husband because that's, that's, the, that's the problem area, you know? You're not talking right now or your wife, so who can I call? Who's another believing brother who can give me some wise counsel in these things? Now, when we look at Mark, Mark teaches us about reconcilement, the importance of reconciling relationships with other, especially with other believers. Jesus tells us in the Gospels that not to come offer our gift if we have a problem with another brother or sister, instead leave our gifts at the altar and go, go and solve that. Go resolve that. Because see, if our horizontal relationships are out of whack, our vertical relationship is also going to be off as well. So we need to make sure that we abide by what the Lord says. Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and, and love your neighbor as yourself. And there, you know, those two relationships tend to affect uh, one another as well. So what we see with Mark is they're together now. They're serving God. So, so it's implied that they got over whatever it is was going on, whether Mark came up to Paul and he initiated and he's like, dude, I'm sorry, I was lazy. I don't, I don't want to go. And I, just, I just didn't want to go on the trip, but I want to go now. And Paul, Paul forgave him. Or if it was Paul who went up to him and was like, hey, Mark, you know, I'm sorry, I overreacted. We don't know what happened. What we do know is that they're serving together now. And that tells me that failure is not final. Failure is not final. That's our next point. Failure is not final. If you have a problem with somebody else, a legitimate problem, not because they didn't say hi to you that morning, but because they actually hurt you or stabbed you in the back, make sure that your heart is ready to forgive them before the Lord. That's what I always tell people. Not every, the majority of the time, people are not going to run up to you and say, hey, I'm sorry I did this. But you know what? Our hearts need to be in, in, a, in a forgiving setting. We need to forgive other people solely on, on God vertically. And what I mean by that is seen in, in Jesus on the cross. When the religious leaders were, you know, mocking him, they were not asking for forgiveness, Right? Yet Jesus doesn't look to them. He looks up to the Father and says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He already had that heart of forgiveness. You know, Stephen does that as well when he's being killed. He doesn't look to them, forgive them, Lord. No, he, 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 he looks up to the Lord and then he says almost identical words because he wasn't about to go to heaven with, uh, with, with, with the unforgiving heart. And that's the idea. We have a heart of forgiveness Forgiveness is literally releasing somebody from debt. The Bible says forgive because you have been forgiven. Love covers a multitude of sins. Failure is not final. Now, number five here, justice. I believe we see uh, a sense of humility. A sense of humility coupled with the word. It is my opinion that he, he chose not to be called Jesus because of, you know, the, those sandals are hard to, to fill. I think it was a, a sort of a humility thing, a humility choice. Nonetheless, what we do know about him is that he was a fellow, fellow worker, okay? He was a worker. He served with Paul. And I think that tells us a lot about this guy. But also, if we look at humility and we look at service, we can't do, we can't do true service without humility. That is, I can't get under God and what he's doing right now if I can't get over myself. If I'm too proud, I'm not, I'm not going to find myself in the grace of God. And he says that, right? He says that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So I need to have that attitude of, of humility, that lowliness for others, and, and, and then I can serve properly as, as, as I should. Because it, take, it takes humility, right? For there to be mobility, it, it takes humility. I need to lower myself so I can be used by the Lord. Our next point is that it takes humility for there to be mobility. John the Baptist, he was a great example of this. John the Baptist said, you know, I'm, I, he must increase and I must decrease. He tells us that. Such a beautiful uh, verse there. And it's so true. Everything we do, it, it, it's, not about, it's not about my name on that book. It's not about the, the, the abbreviation after my name, my career, 
my credentials, who I am in this life. It's about giving God the glory in everything we do. It's, 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 it's a, an important reminder uh, for some of us who might, you know, we, we might be being used in a, maybe in, in the spotlight somewhere, maybe not here, but, but in the outside in our jobs. It's a good reminder to be humble so we can serve better. Next, we look at this guy, Epaphras. I really like what he says about Epaphras, and it really hits close to home when it comes to the, the contrast between religion and relationship. Paul dedicated more ink to Epaphras. And Epaphras teaches us about having zeal for the Lord. Zeal, the, the Greek word is zealos, and, and it means to be boiling hot, to, to be fervent in that sense. Epaphras was hot for the Lord, and it was evidenced through his prayers. Notice that his prayers were the byproduct of being zealous for, 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 for the Lord, for other people. Zeal takes us places. That's our, our po- I have two points for this one. Zeal takes us places. I say that because Epaphras went from Colossae to Rome, a thousand miles away, on foot. He didn't take a flight there. This was, he was not on vacation, right? None, as far as we know, none of this love offering was for him. It was for Paul and the ministry that he was doing. Yet he traveled so far. Who would do that? Who traveled so far by foot and, and, land, and by land and sea to drop something off? And it reminds me of Jesus who, who, you know, he humbled himself and he came down to earth. He traveled from, from heaven, from the highest of highest to be with the lowest of lowest, which is us. And zeal takes us places. And that's what I see with him. He, he didn't just go the distance. He also went to his knees, right? He, he prayed for others. So have zeal, have passion, because if we don't cultivate this passion, this zeal, Church is going to, we're just going to be going through the motions. It's just going to be, well, I'm here another Sunday. Here we go. And I'm going to this again and that event. You know, a full calendar in the church does not mean necessarily that the Spirit is moving. You can have a lot of activi- activities, but that doesn't, that's beside the point. There's a lot of activities to the church next door. Okay? There's a lot of activities everywhere. The, the question is, is there any activity here? Is there any fire going on here? And that's how revival starts. It's got to be individual and then it spreads out the rest of the body and there's a connection between fire and prayer who knows uh when it comes to the the tabernacle you have the holy place and then the holy of holies and the holy place and the holy holies was divided by the veil right remember when jesus died the veil was torn in half and two in the holy of holies there was the ark of the covenant where god's presence met with the the high priest once a year for the day of atonement where he covered the sins of all the people okay who knows what was on this side of the veil in the holy place there was something there who knows what that was candle okay nope those you have the candelabra i think it was to the left and then you have the showbread to the right what was it it was the, the altar of incense. John got it in the first service. I think he's probably want to be humble and not say it now. But, but either way, it's, it's the altar of incense. And it was, it was, it's the altar of incense. You have the veil, and then you have the Ark of the Covenant, which is the presence of God. If the high priest just went in there whenever he wanted, he would die. Okay? He, he would die if he tried to just show up empty-handed. If he didn't bring the sacrifice, the blood, and the, the, the burning incense there, he would die. You see, the burning incense... The smoke would go before him as he entered, as the veil opened, he entered, and it would actually cover the presence of God to the degree that he didn't die. But the the incense is a picture or a symbol of prayer. And this whole place, the Holy of Holies, the tabernacle is also a picture of heaven and entering the presence of God. See, there was angels sewn on, on the on the veil here as well. It's meant to teach us some, a heavenly lesson. So here's what I'm saying. In order for the incense to... To burn, they needed to put, put, put it on hot coals, right? And then it would burn, and God was pleased with that. It was a pleasant aroma to him. For us as well, we need to be fervent in our prayers. There needs to be zeal in our prayers. We can't, we can't pray these lukewarm prayers. And I'm not talking about the length of prayers. I'm not talking about the, the word count. I'm talking about the, the heart. That's what counts, right? The, the heart counts. Is there any zeal in my prayers? Am I just being repetitive, or is my heart in it? So if we cultivate zeal, it's kind of like um, 
it's one of those trains uh, with uh, with the coals, right? You you, you got to keep adding coals for the fire to keep burning, so it can keep going forward, right? Our hearts are like that. Our hearts are like that. They need to keep burning so we can keep going forward. That's what zeal is. Zeal brings us to to our to to kneel. Okay. Zeal causes us to kneel. That's our our next point. If I have the zeal. I'm going to find myself kneeling before the Lord, coming to His presence in prayer more often and, and with purpose. I, I, don't want to, I don't want to do the Christian life half-heartedly. I don't want to, you know, just be barely getting by. I want to, I want to preach the best message every time. I want to love the best as, as much as possible as I can. You know, make everything count. I encourage you to do that uh, as well. It says in James 5.16, The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. That means it goes a long way, but it's got to be fervent it's got to be passionate it's going to be real number seven we look at luke now luke teaches us about resources resources what do i mean by resources luke used his medical resources and his medical knowledge to to serve paul in the ministry to bless others right and and, and as i said earlier paul was a person that needed medical attention regularly the the only reason we know the credentials on luke is because luke used his trait for the ministry, or else we wouldn't know what he did for, for a living because it had no relevance. I want to encourage you, and we're, we're, you know, we're blessed when somebody has a, a certain gift or ability and they bless the body of Christ. It, it's such a blessing, and I'll, 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 I'll mention a few of them right now. I used to work in dialysis for, for a while in the medical field, so I mean, I, I can't, I, unless you need a needle in your artificial you know, vain, then you don't, you don't need me. I can't use my previous traits. But that sound booth back there, Joseph built it when we moved in here. The, the stage I'm, I'm standing on, Joseph built it. Yeah, he had help, right? But it was his expertise in, in construction that, that helped to do that. He built, he built the wall pallets. He built the, the little tables on the wall there for the stools. Um, uh, that, that storage area, that wasn't here when, when we moved here. Andrew Nisley built that. Because you know he was a, 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 a contractor, you know he knows about construction. Um, Lalo, he built the archway. He works also in, in, in construction and painting. He built the archway as soon as you enter the church. You see that uh, Ricky and John Smock. Ricky's a family doctor, and John Smock is a PA. When we went to uh, to Rosarito the first time, we went with a bunch uh, a bunch of medicine, and you know they did the the checkups and they took the temperatures and all that. And that's them using their trades, their profession, their resources to bless the body of Christ. It's such a beautiful thing when we can do that um, for the Lord. Luke is an example of using your re the resources for, for the gospel, for the word of God. Number eight, Demas. Demas teaches us about disappointment in relationships and in servanthood. You know, you know when... Um, when you go to college, if you went to college, often the first two days of class, a teacher will tell you something along the lines of, well, you know, he takes the, the, he sees who's there and all that in the roster. And then he's like, and then he tells you something. He, he lays it down for you. Okay, these are the rules. Often it's like something difficult. You know, this is who I am. This is how it's going to be. And I, I'm not going to give you any second chances or whatever. Um, but then he says, you know, not all of you are going to be here at the end of the year. And it's true. When, when, I, when I was going to college, I, I would see that. I was like, not everybody stayed through the, throughout the year. They, they gave them a certain, a certain time to switch classes if they wanted to, right? And in, in the ministry as well, we see that sometimes where, okay, somebody made a profession of faith. Praise the Lord. And they're like the, um, the soil, the, the, the one soil where, where it sprouted quickly. It came up, but as soon as the sun hit it, again, it's not the sun's fault. The sun is meant to give growth to the plant. It's supposed to feed it in that way. But because the plant was not on, you know, deep soil, it, it, it withered and died. And, and the problems of life killed it. And some people are like that where they'll make a quick profession of faith and they're excited and they're ready to do this and that. And then you don't, you don't see them again. And, and often there's disappointment in the ministry. And I think Demas was one of those people where he was serving. Maybe he seemed like he was on fire for a while, but then he was gone. It says here in 2 Timothy 4.10, Demas has forsaken me. That's Paul speaking. 
Demas has forsaken me. He's bailed out on me, having loved this present world and has departed for Thessalonica. Is that where he was from? Maybe that was his hometown. Maybe he just went back home and started doing his own thing. But he loved the world. What does is, what is loving the world mean? It's not the same as John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's in the negative here. It's not that, oh, you know, love your neighbor. That's not what he was doing. He was loving sin. He was loving the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the lust of the eyes, as 1 John tells us, right? That's what he was loving. So he went back to the world. But I'll tell you what, I think he went back to the world, or he evidenced, he really just evidenced that his heart was never right with the Lord. That is my opinion, that his heart was never truly right with the Lord. Because there's going to be people like, um, like the prodigal son, who was always a son, okay? He was always a son, but he rebelled, and he went out, squandered money. But then when he lost all that, when he was in the, you know, in the mud with the pigs, he's like, man, a servant in my father's house, how's it better? So he, went, he goes back home, and the father is waiting for him with loving arms. He runs to him and embraces him. You know, it's a relationship between a father and a son there. And, and it, it's picturesque of our relationship with, with the Lord. We don't have to work our way to right standing with him. Notice he wanted to work his way. But he's like, no, I'm going to give you a ring, uh, sandals, give you a whole makeover, give you a robe. We're going to have a big, you know, party for you, celebration. And, and that's the thing. We can travel a thousand steps away from the Lord, but it only takes one step to come back to him. Now, the other brother, the other brother was a picture of the Pharisees, the brother that stayed Kept going to church, the brother that kept uh, fasting and praying and doing this and that. There's nothing wrong with those things. The, well, the problem was that the understanding of a relationship with the father. The other brother was, was, was being salty. Okay? He was being, not, not salty like I told you last week, but salty like he was hating on his brother. He's like, why, why does he get that? I didn't get that. I didn't go nowhere. And he didn't understand grace. He didn't, he didn't have the right relationship with the father. He thought it was a merit-based relationship. Look what I've done. What do I get? And that's not what, what, that's religion. So we need to stay away from that. And we can avoid disappointments in the ministry, disappointments in, in servanthood. First John says, if anyone loves the world, the love, the love of the Father is not in him. And isn't that what we saw with Judas, by the way? Judas left Jesus for what? For the world. For pocket change, really. He left Jesus because he never had Jesus. Jesus says, you know, one of you, one among, among you is the devil. And then he said, you know, you're all bathed except one. He was referring to his spiritual uh, life. Number nine, almost done here. Bear with me. Number nine is uh, Nymphus. Nymphus teaches us about hospitality. How, you know, the beauty of hospitality, of opening up your home to, to the church, to the body of Christ. Be it for the word of God, like here, right? Or be it for, for an ice cream social. Like Monica and Cecilia opened up their house last night. I saw some pictures. I wasn't invited for some reason, but uh, I saw some pictures. Um, and, you know, it looked great. You guys did an awesome job decorating. You know, it's awesome. And I'm sure the ladies were blessed. And, and, and that's the beauty of midweek fellowship. You can, you can open up a home um, and, and invite someone over and have fellowship with them. Have fellowship. And start, I mean, there, isn't there something different about a living room setting? A living room setting, just being in, in the, you know, the comfort of, of, of unity and, and community. That there, there's something different about that that is also a blessing that sometimes we don't, we leave untapped. Hospitality, so important. And number 10, lastly, Archippus. Here, he teaches us about the, the importance of exhortation. Exhortation sometimes is neglected. Sometimes people, when they hear the word exhortation, they think uh, a regaño, right? Or, uh, you know, I'm getting rebuked. Exhortation isn't, isn't necessarily that. Exhortation is, is telling the truth, is being direct with people, something that they need to hear, always with a lo in, in a loving manner, but not beating around the bush, okay? When, when you exhort someone, you, you're communicating the truth to them. And he says in verse 17, Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. Why did he need to tell him to take heed to the ministry? Wasn't he doing that already? Well, it's likely that he, he was discouraged and needed somebody to remind him of that, to take heed to the ministry. And it's an important reminder for us. See, exhortation, and that's what I try to do with every message, by the way. I don't spend too much time on maps and 
how far this city was from that city and what archaeologists found this and that. I think, I think leave that for the Bible studies. I think just get to the point. You know, what, what does the Holy Spirit want to tell me today? What, what do I need to know, Lord, so I can handle this problem I have tomorrow? And, and that's the thing. That's exhortation, encouraging you, ch- leaving you challenged with the Word of God so, so you have that homework, we have that homework throughout the week. See, exhortation creates motivation, and motivation leads to continuation. That's what Paul wanted. God, dude, I want you to continue in the ministry. I want you to fulfill it. It says right there. God has given every one of us a calling, a ministry. Um, not all of us have an office, but there is a calling. There is a gift that we must walk in, and we need encouragement. We need to remember that, uh, that faithful are the wounds of a friend. Sometimes your friends are going to, your true friends are going to tell you, you know, hey, you need to stop that, quit that relationship. It's not healthy for you. You know, you should probably stay away from this vice, you know. Before you know how that thing used to keep you in bondage, why are you messing around with it now, right? I mean, there's some things that you guys are free to do that I'm not free to, that are sin to me because they used to keep me, you know, in bondage. So I stay away from even having just a little bit of it because I know what it's going to lead to too so you know that's that's for me that's my my law but the idea is this we still need exhortation because exhortation creates motivation and motivation leads to continuation so these 10 traits are good things to remember to make us well-rounded christians you know maybe warren is good with um with with uh being a fellow servant right but he needs work on being a fellow prisoner right maybe uh Viviana needs work on, on being, uh, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of one of these. What's the first one? Uh, exhortation, right? Maybe Viviana needs help on, 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 on giving exhortation, right? But she's, uh, she's excelling in relationships, in reconciliation, right? Every one of us are strong in one area and maybe weak in another area. So if we're strong in one of these areas, hey, you know what? Move to the next one and excel in those things. Surround yourself with people that are strong where you are weak, and they're going to exhort you to be, to be a well-rounded Christian. Lastly, before we pray here, Paul says, Remember my chains. Grace be with you. Amen. Remember that not all open doors are going to be a walk in the park. Some, you're going to be in chains. You're going to be restricted and limited. But know that you're right there in the will of God in it and through it because when we are weak he is strong through us father we thank you lord for your word and we ask lord that you would give us grace that you would give us mercy lord that you would fill us with your spirit so we can walk in these traits that you have laid out that you've described for us uh, about these men and Lord, I also ask most the, the most important thing that we ask of you, Lord, is that you would save the lost, that you would draw them to you, Lord, that we would not motivate anyone, Lord, through the mechanisms of, 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 of rhythm or, or, or emotions, Lord, that, that it would be your spirit who would truly draw people to, to repentance. Your kindness, Lord, leads to repentance and salvation. So we thank you, Lord, for the gospel, which is your son dying for our sins and rising on the third day, Lord. We thank you for that. We trust in you by faith alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand together.